who have joined us tonight, both in person and via live stream. It is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. And that's what we want to do tonight. This will be our 34th exposition of the book of Amos. It's a lot of woes, a lot of judgments. And they're toward people that belong to God. And we're continually continued to be exposed to divine manners. How God reacts to things. Uh, I think a lot of people do not have probably thought very little about about this. That there are reactions both to faith and to unbelief, both to faithfulness and to unfaithfulness. There's a, there's divine reactions to all of these things, and he's going to show us uh, tonight how he observes people who go about as being people associated with him, but their lives aren't harmonious with this profession at all. God does observe the character of people. See, I don't know if you've ever been limited in your views of this, but some people have only thought about what God, how God reacts to what he sees people do. But he also reacts to what he sees people are. Amen. And to their character. Even among those that aren't have no immediate connection with him, that are not in covenant with him. God still observes that, whether they're Philistines or whether they're Israelites. This Nebuchadnezzar or King Saul. This is the way God is. <coughs> See, the world of Noah's day was noted for degeneracy of thought. The imaginations of their heart was evil continually, and God took note of that. It was a it was a dominating, it dominated humanity, a degenerate thinking. It thought only evil continually, which means it only had to do with himself. Then you see in Sodom there was a display of especially perverse iniquity, and he reacted to that. Ezekiel gave a text that sometimes Sodomites quote to, to say that God didn't judge Sodom because of its sodomy. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. Behold, this was the, the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So they read that and say, they see, that's what the real, that's what the real sin of Sodom was. It wasn't sodomy. Or as they say these days, which is strictly a psychological term, homosexuality. But see, I gather these are the sins that led to that Sin. That is, this these kind of sins create a seedbed where this yeah. other yeah. reprehensible conduct yeah. can grow out of it. During Abraham's day, the iniquity of the Am Amorites wasn't full yet. Mm -hmm. See, see, God takes note of wh where people are in the matter of evil. See, there's some people he just he takes hands off of them for a while mm -hmm. till their iniquity waxes full that he just he can't. Can't help but deal with it, so to speak. I'm showing you God's reaction, see, to, to people, to things. Jesus spoke of a generation, his generation. They were an arrogant people. A whole generation now. He's just not talking just about the people during that, that lived in Jerusalem. It was a generation of Jewish people. And they were a generation that were arrogant. They, Jesus said they were like a generation that played a tune, and if you didn't, if you didn't dance to it, they got upset. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> We're in a generation like that, too. This, he, he, he sees these things. That's the point that I'm laboring to establish here. Solomon said this, there is a generation, a generation, not just there are people, there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are not pure in their own eye that are pure that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Mm -hmm. This is a whole span generation spanning 30, 40 years. There are whole generations like this. We're in a generation like that. It started 30 or 40 years ago, and it's a generation. This is a dominant trait of this generation. People say, well, that's not true. Well, they just don't know what they're talking about. That's all. They just don't know what they're talking about. There is a generation like this, basically self-centered, has no respect for parents. and There's a generation like that, and God notes it. That's the point that I'm making here. <coughs> David said, made this observation, the wicked through the pride of this countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all their thoughts. They just bow their back and they won't seek. So, you can try and talk them into it, they won't seek God. You can rebuke them, they won't seek God. There's a generation like that, people like that. My point is that God sees that. He's not near as tolerant as we are of it, let me tell you. Sometimes people learn to live with us because then they don't have so much trouble. They don't want to just be a pain all the time, but God's not that way. God, through Amos, is going to make known now how he looks upon people, particularly his own people. We're going to look at the first two verses of the sixth chapter of Amos. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. What? Let me read that again. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye into Kelna and see. And from thence go ye to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms? Or their border greater than your border? Telling questions, huh? Yes. So we're going to look at that, see what we can get out of this tonight. Now allow me to re refresh your mind that God's still speaking to Israel. We're, not, we're just we're commencing the sixth chapter. Up to this point, God's dealt with Damascus and Syria, Gaza and the Philistines, Tyrus, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Judah. That's up through chapter two and verse four, and He's been dealing with Israel ever since. We're, and now we're in the sixth chapter, the first verse that he's still dealing with Israel. He'll do it to the end of the book, all the way to the ninth chapter, yeah. dealing with Israel. See, when God divided the nation of Israel, he rented, he rented out of Solomon's hand because Solomon didn't, wasn't, didn't please him. Some people say Solomon's the wisest man who ever lived. No, he wasn't either. No, he wasn't. No, he was not. Amen. His wisdom was under the sun. He's, he had most of the worldly wisdom. Yeah. He had more worldly wisdom than anybody else. And it didn't sustain him. No, the right. God proved to you, see. Uh -huh. He took all the worldly wisdom, he dumped it out on one man, and he proved to you, you've got to have more than that yes. Amen. to please God. Mm -hmm. How's Amen. that? There it is, lived, lived out right before your eyes.
Now he chose, when he rent the kingdom out of Solomon's hand, he chose to give ten, ten tribes to Jeroboam. And primarily Judah and part of Benjamin, he gave to develop the Messianic line. He's going to develop the Messianic line through whom the Son of God would come. But he chose to do it to the minority, yeah, that's right. yeah. not the majority, to Judah, primarily. And then Israel's who he's pronouncing these woes to. And to some extent, Judah was included, but only because it, it, Israel rubbed off on him. And he presents this chapter by saying, woe, woe. <clears throat> now, it's interesting how other versions translate this. Some say, alas. Basic Bible English says, sorrow. The other Bible says, doom. How horrible it will be is another. Good new, good God's Word Bible. New Jerusalem Bible says, disaster. New Living Translation says, what sorrow awaits you. The Jewish Bible says, ah. The contemporary English version says, you're in trouble. Well, how terrible it will be, Good News Bible says. Whoa. There's more of a, 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 instead of an exact expression, there's more of a tone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to this expression. It's the second time woe has been used in a pronouncement against Israel, the first being the chapter 5, verse 18. The word, word woe relates to lamentation and the crying out of of lamentation, <laughs> grief, an exclamation of grief. This word is, Isaiah uses this word 21 times. Whoa. <laughs> I'd like that to be your main message. Whoa. <laughs> it's used 33 times from Matthew through Revelation. <clears throat> Whoa. Whoa. In the Hebrew language, it means uh, an expression of grief and sorrow. In the Greek language, it means an exp expression of grief, basically the same thing. In the English language, it's used to express grief, regret, or distress. So it's, it's an expression rather than a feeling. In this text, what was the result of conditions brought on by God Himself? God's going to produce, mm -hmm. God's going to produce expressions that'll make folk express grief yeah. Amen. and woe. Yeah. See, some people think God doesn't do this, but this God does do this. It's a cry that is more emotional than an intellectual. It's not a cry of insight. It's a cry of hurt and pain and confusion and it is that kind of cry cry of misery in this case it's the result of divine judgment yeah. so some people we actually teach that God would never do anything like this but here you have it God is God is going to do something like this you say well so what well have you ever had grief did you trace it back to God did you? Or did you blame someone else for it? Huh. It's God with whom you have to do. Amen. And you can find a lot of reasons why it's deserving that we have grief, too, incidentally. Just look. <laughs> if you were to state this doctrinally, this is how you'd say it. <coughs> Hosea 2.6, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns. All right, that's, that's what produces the grief. You get these just stuck all the time. You hurt, it hurts you to make progress. Hurts. Hurts to go in a certain direction, to pursue your way. It hurts. And this woe is the result, as I say, of something God has done himself Life will become a burden. 
it'll become hard to live. Now, most of us have a pretty easy time when it comes to living. We can live without just a little inconvenience and this sort of thing, but, oh, God can make it hard to live, difficult to live. Sometimes it's not just punishment. Sometimes it's training. Sometimes you have to train his people to suffer. You have to learn how to suffer to the glory of God. I would go so far as to say that everybody has to learn how to suffer. You have to learn how to pass through it. Some people do a very lousy job of suffering. They just, I suppose all of us start out that way, but you really got to grow out of that. You got to be a good sufferer. Then it probably won't last as long. God. That's right. Woe, he says, woe, who, who's, woe to them that are at ease. What? Isn't that what the natural man wants ease? See, they're, they're, they labor for ease. They lay up treasures for ease. They, they look forward to ease. See, woe to them that are at ease. Word means complacent. Or rested in comfort. I just tore down my barns and built some new ones. I'm going to take my ease now. Uh -huh. Take thy ease. That's what he said to his soul. Yeah. Resting comfortably or are wealthy in Zion. That's one of because wealth makes for ease for some people. Wealthy, those that are wealthy in Zion, those that are so comfortable, those that lounge in luxury. They're secure, they feel secure in Zion. They're treating Zion with contempt is a kind of one shade of meaning. They feel safe and at ease, they're enjoying life, they have such an easy life, and they think they're living on easy street. <laughs> Message Bible says, woe to them. Think they got it made. God spent nearly four chapters upbraiding Israel for their sins. The corruption of their pretentious worship. Well, he blew the whistle on them. Their unjust treatment of the poor and the downtrodden, their lack of righteous judgment. He hammered them because of this. The heavenly assessment of the nation, its leaders, and its religion was critical. I wonder sometimes... Uh, What God thinks of our nation, the churches in it. I wonder what he thinks about it. Well, I prep a pretty good idea, but it's good to, not to surmise, but to just ponder. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have enough evidence in Scripture about how God feels about certain things. I mean, there's enough in there. We should be able to draw some conclusions. But I don't hear many people uh, encouraging no. people to think about this. What does God think? So some uh, naive soul blurts out of my people that are called by my name will humble themselves, call upon the name of the Lord, I'll hear from heaven, you know, and so that's the answer, let's all pray and God will turn it around, well, that, I don't know that that's the answer. I don't know that we are fit into that category, call by my name. It depends whether you fit in that category or not. I don't think God called this nation. You know, that's anti-American. I'll call her what you want. I don't think he did. If he did, he's very disappointed. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Woe to those that are at ease. Look where they were at ease, though. They're in Zion. Zion. That's a prominent hill in Jerusalem. In fact, the temple is built on Mount Zion, and Jerusalem is built on Mount Zion, and sometimes Zion is called, Jerusalem is called Zion, sometimes. Israel's religion was corrupt in the eyes of God. There are people at ease in Zion. Zion belonged to Judah, technically. It was in Judah's territory. It wasn't in Israel's territory, so how come this is a diatribe against Israel about people that 
ease in Jerusalem, in Zion, Mount Zion. That belonged to Judah. Mount of Samaria belonged to Israel, and Samaria was the capital of Samaria. So why? Well, I think it's because Israel rubbed off. Rubbed off, and they were, uh, some of the people are probably more luxurious. Jerusalem was a very luxurious place. And so I imagine some of the, they went back there and lived in luxury from the taxes and so forth they'd exacted on people. This is where the city of God was, where the temple of God was. It's where the presence of God could be found between the two cherubs, as thou that dwelled between the cherubim that were over the mercy, on the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Covenant. So that was in Jerusalem. That's where all of this is in Mount Zion. All of this is in Zion. And you dwell at ease at that place. It would have been better in Samaria to dwell in ease than to be at ease in Zion, where God is. Yet in the very presence of God, there were people that were relaxed, luxurious, like a glorious vacation. Of course, this is the same thing that characterizes Babylon the Great. Its adherents are at ease. They've got a comfortable doctrine consoles them and how they live. They've got a specially created God that tolerates those their kind of people and is a kindly disposed toward them. They're living in the lap of luxury. Think of the people that are. Think of the staggering religious empires that are in Christianity. Multi-million, some of the multi-billion empires or people are the lap of luxury. Fleet of, not Cadillacs, they got the Rolls Royces and the Bentleys. All in Zion. Television empires. Breathtaking for the scope of their influence and the investment that's made in them. Million dollar buildings. We had one parachurch ministry in this very town that built a building that cost a million dollars. In Joplin it cost a million dollars. It's over in the woods off of Main Street. I won't tell you what it is, but it's a matter of it's well known. So I'm saying that's not right. Whatever people may say. That was an organization, it still is an organization, where back when I was working for the school or college, I, I kind of an average income would have been like Twenty-six, twenty-seven thousand dollars. With one of the lowest incomes of this ministry was fifty thousand dollars. Huh? Yeah. That's that's what this is the kind of thing he's talking about here. Well, they had, they had their reasons. If you was if you was to ask them, they'd they'd have their reasons why they were this way, had more influence and more successful sort of thing. But this, they were at ease in Zion. Because when you walked in their facility, I think we have one of our sisters worked there. If you worked in their facilities, you were not impressed with the hubbub of activity that was going on, was you? Anyone been there? You, you, you know what I'm talking about. It was not noted for people rushing about doing all kind of work, acting for the. It was ease. That's just one. There's, there's, there's others. Other denominations have them too. You understand. And gatherings of these kind of people, they tend to be disarming. It's, it's this. It's this. It's this bad. That if during the week a person is convicted of sin, he can actually go to church and be relieved of the conviction. 
good pumped up praise service and you forget all that stuff and that's being at ease in Zion. See, that's the type of thing that this text is talking about. So through the prophet Amos, God is teaching us his reaction to people who dwell, are at ease in Zion. Zion is intended to be an area of intense activity. Godward toward men. It's not intended to be a place of idleness and in idle pleasure. Yes? Just because it's not intended for a place of idle pleasure and it's meant for activity doesn't mean that it won't be immune to troubles and hard circumstances for those who are in it. Because Jesus told us, beware, well not, not beware, said, don't fear because the world hated me before it hated you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then in Acts, Peter and John rejoice to be worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the adversity gives you a chance to grow. I know I've been making this point a lot recently, but it's a good one to dwell on because adversity makes you stronger. That's why Jesus sends it. So a, a so-called Christian without diversity... It's questionable whether or not you're yeah, a Christian. Christian. Yeah, because adversity is because you're in a hostile world. Adversity happens to be part of the quote the Christian life, because you are in a hostile world that does not sympathize with you. It hated Jesus, and it hates you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't learn to disguise it kind of well, but it still exists. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're related to them or not. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. They turn you off in a second. Mm -hmm. Blood relation. Doesn't make any difference. Oh, yeah. Those that are at ease in Zion don't experience that that's right. kind of thing. But he goes on. And trust in the mountain of Samaria. Trust. Some versions say, feel secure in the mountain. Have no fear of danger in the mountain. Feel complacent in the mountain. Have confidence in the mountain. They're... Everybody trusts in something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Everybody trusts in something. Amen. Psalmist put it this way in the 20th Psalm, verse 7 and 8. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God they brought down they they are brought down and fallen but we are risen and stand upright <laughs> yeah so there see some trust like in an institution trust in strength some trust in their intellect some trust in their library they do they trust in it these people trusted in the mountain of Samaria. Solomon said that there are those who trusted in riches. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He also said there are those that trust their own heart. Proverbs twenty eight twenty six. And Jeremiah said, "Cursed is ever is the man that trusts in man." You see, there's everybody trusts in something. And these people trusted in a mount in the mountain of Samaria. Now God extolled Mount Zion, not, not the mountain of Samaria. Mount Zion is beautiful for situation. Mount, the mountain of Samaria isn't. Mount Zion is a perfection of beauty, Psalm 50, verse 2. It's a place where God dwelt, Psalm 9, 11. David talked about this mountain. He says, I will look and lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I'd never heard this explanation until I came to our venerable city. But it was taught in a certain place that this was a rebuke for doing the wrong thing, or lift up my eyes to the hills from what's come with my Lord, that that's wrong to do that. My help comes from the Lord. <laughs> Poor people. Jerusalem was surrounded by hills. And it was a depiction of divine protection. 
I don't know where that explanation come from, but I think it was a kind of a unique one that certain people developed. Now, in the beginning of his prophecy, Joel said, uh, Amos said, God will roar out of Zion. He didn't say he'd roar out of Samaria. Roar out of Zion. But some of Israel chose to trust in the mountain of Samaria. They thought it was a place of special safety. Now, the mountain of Samaria uh, was purchased by Omri, king of Israel. And he also built the city of Samaria there. See, God established Zion. I want to make it here. 1 Kings 16, 23 tells you about that. And Ahab built a temple to Baal there. 1 Kings 16, 32. And the city became known, according to 2 Kings 10, 25, as the city of the house of Baal. Uh, some people trusted in the mountain of Samaria on which Samaria was built. <clears throat> it was considered to be nearly impregnable, if not thoroughly impregnable. This is largely based on the experience they had in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And it took him three years to overcome it. Okay, so people can look. Ah, it's a, this is a safe, safe haven. So they trusted in the mountain of Samaria. Now, you could put a lot of things in a place of mountain of Samaria that people trust in. They actually trust in them. Some people trust in doctors. They do, they trust in them. We're not talking about using them in a lawful manner. We're talking about trust now. Right. Trust. We're talking about trust. Yeah. It's just like medicine is like a mountain of Samaria. Yeah, that's right. You can't trust in those Amen. things. You may use them. Uh -huh. You may ask God to bless them and this sort of thing. I don't, I don't question that, but the tr you don't trust in them. That's right. Your trust is to be in God or Mount, Mount Zion. Amen. <laughs> Yes. That psalm, he says, some trust in horses, some in chariots. Mm -hmm. People trust in the name of the Lord yeah. God. Israel used horses. That's right. But their trust wasn't in it. So the Amen. it wasn't that it was wrong to use them. Yeah. That's or, a good distinction or, that you made, is that the, that's the right. using or availing of something uh -huh. is not equal to the trusting in it. That's right. They had horsemen and horses. That's so right. Paul said using the things but not abusing. Amen. Blessed is he that knows the difference. Now he adds, which are named chief of the nations. Now that requires a little bit of investigation. Other versions, they, he's defining who does who trusts in the mount, mountain of Samaria. Other versions say the notable persons in the chief in the chief nation. New American Standard Bible says, a distinguished men of the foremost nation. The notables of the first of the nations, New Revised Standard, renowned people in this foremost of nations, leaders of the first among the nations, and notable men of the chief because chosen by God of the nations. All right, cut to the chase. The chief of the nations was Israel. She was the chief of the nations. That she was the most important nation above all other nations by divine choice and by divine preference and these notables were in that in that nation that were trusting in the mountain of Samaria see 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 how serious how serious this was God said that Israel was a peculiar treasure this is before the nation was split. The whole, whole of Israel was a peculiar treasure above all people. Mm -hmm. Exodus 19.5. He brought them out of the iron furnace of Egypt to be unto him a people of inheritance. Of his, that he was going to. Mm -hmm. 
he was going to inherit them. Samuel prayed concerning them, And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do great things and terrible, and for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations, and from their gods. That's the chief of nations. He just described the chief of nations. Now the leading men of this nation are trusting in Mount, in the mountain of Samaria. Yeah. See how serious that is? Yeah. We learn from this that even a chosen and preferred nation cannot sanctify a people. Yeah. You can't be sanctified by a nation, not even a chosen nation. Yeah. Only God sanctifies. Or to put it in our language, you can't be sanctified because you belong to, quote, the right church. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't sanctify you. God sanctifies you through Christ, Uh through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You can't be sanctified by a creed or or the true doctrine. Uh That doesn't set you apart. You see that in this text. They trusted. He's a chosen people now. Trusted in the Mount of Samaria, mountain of Samaria, but that mountain couldn't give them any edge. It was no advantage at all in trusting this mountain. No matter how much history you could recite and how you could recount how it had been successful in protection, it would it was wrong to trust in that mountain. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, that's precisely why denominationalism is, is so bad. That's right. It's because people it's not it's not that everything within the denominational traditions are yeah. bad. It's that it's like the mountains of Samaria. They it, they end up trusting in those yeah. things yeah. rather than in God. Amen. Uh-huh. And this 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 goes for there there are groups of people that that if you just look at what they're teaching and what they say, it's it, it you can't really find a lot of fault yeah. in their doctrine. The, the problem is, is the people become proud of their of themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They become proud of their own tradition, and they actually trust in that thing that they're in, yeah. like Amen. Th- than they do in the living God Himself. Mm-hmm. It's it's a very subtle yes, deception, though. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. I imagine if you walked around the mountain of Samaria, it would probably was was it impressive. Yeah. Uh, Impressive uh, mountain, and it might have some strong trees, right. cedar trees, and fruit uh-huh. trees, and yeah. but you couldn't trust it. That's right. You always see some reactions that, if you can understand where they're coming from, you can see why they said that. I've heard a man say, "We need to to get to know the God of the Bible instead of the Bible," but he was reacting to this thing that Jason just talked That's about. Right. He saw that the people were trusting in, in a book. But they never had anything to do with the God who wrote the book. That's right. And that's what, that, you know, but see, I know it needs to be said right, but I, I finally yeah. I saw what he was saying. Yeah. We better know God in the end. Yeah, these, right. some people call it bibliolatry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Another yeah. companion thought is, is too, there's a, there's a subtle deception. People get off, their whole goal is just to be right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Very good. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Now, now this you got to be. I got to be careful what I'm saying because it's, I'm not justifying being wrong. No. no. Amen. We, we should love look. the truth and That's seek right. truth. But there is a there is a trust. There's there's sort of a there's an at ease. Oh, we're right. Yeah. And, and people just kind of relax. See, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and take comfort in the fact that they're right. Hmm. But, this, but it, that's wrong. <laughs> that's right. You're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Very subtle. I was thinking earlier on the, the first point of them, them that are at ease. What the difference would be in them that have rest. Uh-huh. And Jesus, Jesus said, yeah, I will say give you rest. Yeah. And there, the difference is that promise of rest is given to them that labor. That's right. Good. So Good. The, those Amen. that labor and are heavy laden mm-hmm. that come to Jesus are given rest. rest. But at yeah. the same time, there's a woe level to them that are at ease. Mm, so good. see, it's a it's a labor mm-hmm. and a good. burden. 
uh, be, because of the presence of sin and the presence yeah. of evil in the world and being uncomfortable, being beset by that. And then Jesus gives rest in the midst of that. Amen. And ease is, uh, is actually being comfortable in a condition that God condemns. Yeah, I, th I think we could su substantiate that rest is only for the people that labor. Yeah, that that it, yeah see, the, 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 even the words, the word ease, it just has something right. in, inappropriate. That's right. It. But rest yeah. is, is, is right. It's, it's, a, right. it's a wholesome experience. Yeah. The seventh day was after you worked That's for right. six days. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. uh -huh. And you rested. Uh -huh. Yes, this is well, Jesus rested when he sat down at, at Jacob's well, but That's he was right. working. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, he, yeah, he worked about more than the disciples out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trust these, these people are at ease in Zion, trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief. These people are the key people. Of the nations of a member of the of the chief nations of the people, to whom the house of Israel to whom the house of Israel came. Now this is not referring to when they came into Canaan and drove out the drove out the enemy. That's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is that Israel went to these nations for help. <laughs> they went to them for consultation. Now the scriptures speak about this. Isaiah said this word, Isaiah 31, 1, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. To stay on horses. Stay means lean on, trust in horses, and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen, because they are very strong, but they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. See, they went down, these other nations, thinking they were obtaining safety and help. We need a little bit of help here. They make alliances with other nations. Again, it is written, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, Quran, if a man lean, it'll go through his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. Isaiah 36, 6. Hanani, the seer. What? I'd like to be known as a seer. Hanani, the seer. That's what they call prophets. Rebuke King Asa, saying, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. Yeah. You're not going to win against them now. Yeah. See, the wisdom of the world is foolish. God has told us it's foolish. There still are people that rely on it. Yeah. They trust it. The wisdom of the world. They go down now. They go out to the world to oh, yeah. learn how to raise money. Yeah. Yeah. Learn how to teach people how to make wills. Uh -huh. yeah. They get oh, yeah. kind of personal. This huh? oh, yeah. teach people how to build an organization, how to write bylaws. Mm -hmm. They go to other nations. That God hasn't chosen. The point is, you should never seek advice from someone who's not reconciled to God. Amen. Amen. That's right. I, I, for me, that I mean never. That's. Uh -huh. I don't know anything about stocks and bonds. A little bit, not much. But I will not go to someone who's not reconciled to God to get some information about it. I just yeah. will. I just will not. That's all. So they went to whom they they trust. These are people trusted the mountains, mountain of Samaria, and they went down to other nations. Even though they came from the chief nation, Israel was the chief nation. God chose them so other nations would come to them for advice. So other nations would come to them for wisdom, and here they were going to the other nations. God took note of it. In a generation where the church has been guilty of this very thing. Oh, yes. they've, they, they've had enough sense to see that we have sin in the camp, but they haven't gone to God for help. Yep. They went to like AA. 
and adopted some some laws, say these, these five steps or eight steps, eight steps, and built celebrate recovery. Mm-hmm. That's built based on something that a man came up with, not God. That's right. Now you got to be careful. You got to agitate the troops. Yeah. <laughs> Final word. Pass ye. He calls them to reason now. Pass ye into Calne and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? Now he's going to call on Israel to examine the effects of other nations round about them. I want you to go down there and see how these nations, most of which he had judged, and see how they're how they're faring. And once you see it, you need to ask yourself, what am I going to them for advice for? Uh Pass ye into Kelne, or go over to it. Kelne was a town in southern Babylonia. It was founded by Nimrod. So it was an ancient, uh, now we're talking about an ancient city. Founded by Nimrod, and was located in the land of Shinar, where they started building a tower. So that'd be a, a good experiential terrain. It generally assumed that it's the same as Cal No mentioned in Isaiah 10:9. This is one of the cities conquered by the Assyrians. So this was not like a stable city. It had been it had been defeated and overthrown. And see now, see. That is, look at it. See what happened there. Examine, examine Kelney there. Check out and see what... Well, if we were here, we'd say, now, if you want to know about you know, tornadoes, go down and check Pierce City. See, see how that worked out down there. In other words, you... God calls upon people. See, God's governing. The, he's the governor among the nations. God's governing all people, whether they know it or not. Mm-hmm. So I says, now you look. I, I passed some judgments. I told you about it through my prophet Amos. I told you about some other nations I judged. Just, now go down there and see how they're doing. And then you explain to me how, why you think you can get by with doing the same thing they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I tell you, it's potent reason. <laughs> and see, look at it. See what happened there. Walk around it. This city, as Isaiah 10, 5 says, was conquered by the Assyrians. And go to Hamath the Great. That's a bigger city. It's a city through which Israel passed when they went to spy out the land. They went, to, went to, from Hamath. Numbers thirteen twenty one. It was also on the border of Canaan. And, and it was part of Canaan. It was, it was right on the boundary line. Sennacherib boasted to Hezekiah that he had defeated this city. He mentioned Hamath. When he wrote that letter, you remember? And threatened Hezekiah. He mentioned this city. He defeated it. And he said their gods couldn't protect them. It said of the king of Assyria who overthrew Kelna and Hamath, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand of my in their hand is mine indignation. So God through Sennacherib judged this city. And go down to Gath of the Philistines. It's written of this city. Hazel, Hazel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it, and Hazel set his face to go to Jerusalem. Uzziah, king of Judah, he even broke down the wall of Gath. So it just suffered some overthrows. Go on, see. Tell me what you think of that broken down wall down there. Check it out. Go down there. Evidently, at the time of this prophecy, judgment against these cities was obvious. That's why he asked him to go down there. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's a saying people should learn from others. That's right. That's but right. they don't. That they don't. Carnal people do not learn from the mistakes of mm. others. That's right. Nations and whole generations don't learn anything mm. from no. history. No. You know, we have this maxim that says those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But that's exactly what happens. Yeah. yeah. No that's worry. why there's still war. Yeah. You'd right. think we, you know, the human race would learn, but no. 
As one person said, the one thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. That's right. <laughs> but that's a mark of the flesh. That's, that's right. exactly right. That's, that's, that's why that condition exists. You can't teach flesh. That's right. The things that flesh needs to know, you uh -huh. can't. Yeah. Can't teach it out. Go down there and see. Then he asked, are you better than these kings? Now, the different translations... <laughs> come up with their usual confusion on this. The New King James Version says, Are you better than these kingdoms? The New NIV says, Are you better off than, are they better off than your two kingdoms? That'd be Judah and Israel. The Net Bible says, Are, are they superior to our kingdoms? The Net Jerusalem Bible says, Are they more powerful than these kingdoms? The New Living Translation says, you are no better than they were, and look how and how they were destroyed. The Living Bible says, once they were better and greater than you, but look at them now. The Amplified Bible says, are they better than these, your kingdoms? So see, you got these <laughs> two views. One view says, are you better than them? The other view, this is Bible translation. The other say, are they better than you? No wonder people get confused reading the scriptures. Now, the word being delivered is to those that are at ease in Zion. Mm -hmm. That's who's being addressed. <laughs> Who were trusting in the mountain of Samaria and secondarily to a na the nation of Israel mm -hmm. who was recalcitrant in their view toward God. The point being made is this. How reasonable is it that the Lord did not fail to examine the manners of the heathen but you think he's not going to examine yours. Yeah. How is it when God found flaws in these other kingdoms he, and cities, he did something about it, but you think he's not going to do anything about yours? Yeah. And you can apply this personally to yourself. Mm -hmm. You can take individuals in Scripture that God judged. Cain and Onan and Esau and a lot of people he judged. Then you can ask yourself, what would make me think that God would judge them for their sin but let me get by with it? You can ask yourself the, yeah. the question. You're, you, you need to come up with an answer. That's not something we answer for one another. Mm -hmm. So he's speaking of Israel, the chief of nations, saying, now these nations weren't the chief of nations. Mm -hmm. These were inferior to you. And if I judge the inferior... What makes you think I'm not going to judge the superior? Yeah, of course, he that hath committed the greater sin will receive the greater judgment, you know. This is the way God uh, works. Again, the people, the people thought they're the exception. That's, That's right. right. That's uh -huh. why he has That's to talk right. this way. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how carnal people think. Mm -hmm. it, that, that person... They got caught, but, but they're not as smart as me. I'm not going to get caught. Yeah. And this is the way people think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this mountain, mm -hmm. this mountain of Samaria, mm -hmm. let's see. that comes into the scenario too. Yeah. Maybe we'll know what to do. We'll run. That's what we'll do. Wow. Yes, Sister Nikki. Yeah, I was just considering that when, when God saw sin placed on his own son. Mm -hmm. yeah, he judged it. That's right. So he what judged makes it. any of us think that it's not going to be judged on if, mm, if it's amen. found on us? If he amen. even his own son. Amen. Mm -hmm. it's right. Well, it's the nature of sin to explain a, a nature of flesh to explain away the consequence of sin in such a way as to exempt <coughs> itself. Mm -hmm. Flesh is always looking for the exemption. Yes, that's right. And always gives itself the exemption. Amen. Yeah, anything but having to stop the sin. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anything but that's right. But you, you don't understand. I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. You know? All right, so a, a, a kingdom can't exclude you from judgment. Yeah. Or an organization. Or a church. Or <laughs> A body of people, any body of people cannot insulate you from divine scrutiny and judgment. Mm -hmm. But that's not all he says. Is their border greater than yours? I mean, maybe, maybe the size, 
like if you have a war against Russia, it's a lot different than having a war against Israel. It's such a tremendous territory, it's a, becomes to be a challenge now how you're going to... But in the kingdom of God, how much territory they occupied doesn't insulate them. If the majority of people are not Christian, this this doesn't make sin any more palatable at all to God. Yeah. You gonna say something, Sister Tasha? Okay. The amount of territory occupied is not the determining factor. Some people teach that our status outweighs our character. So this is the basis of, of once saved, always saved. This is the basis of that doctrine. Your status overrides whatever you do. But that isn't the truth. Your status alters what you do. Your status in Christ changes what you do. It doesn't sanctify everything you do. Others reject this view See, some people think if you're called Christian, that that, mm -hmm. if you're part of the Christian community, that will insulate you. Yeah, but right. no, it doesn't at all. This is why, uh, that's why confession is still necessary. That's for, right. For, that's right. It, if that view was, if that view was correct, mm -hmm. if it's well, it's just all covered under the blood and everything. Then why does the Scripture tell us to confess? Confess. Mm -hmm. That's right. Good point. Because yeah. you you have to recognize when there's sin. That, and that's what confession is. It's, like it's acknowledging. Amen. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't. That wouldn't be necessary. You just say, "Well, Amen. I'm justified. It's mm -hmm. no big deal." Amen. Now, God will deal with sin. It'll first come in the form of chastisement. That's His first reaction. But for those that ignore it, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You just don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't want to be in that category. So you see, you can see the reasoning of, of the Lord here. It shouldn't, but it it shouldn't be necessary for God to reason like this. But when you have a religious people that are dominated by the flesh, this is the kind of reasoning. If you walk in the Spirit, all this makes perfect sense. You say, "Keep me back from presumptuous sins." See, you, you, come at, you come at life from a different vantage point. I don't want to offend you at all. You say that you, say it's, you come at it that way rather than after the fact. 